Well, you are all in for a treat because Ari is one of the most prolific and successful CEOs in the space that all of us are in. And so why don't we just kind of start with the basics. Uh, for those that may not know, what is Glide? Um, and how did you get started? Sure. So before I get into the specifics of what Glide is and tell you a little bit about myself, maybe we'll just take a step back, take a deep breath, and recognize where we are in the world right now. So we are in LA, the biggest tech ecosystem in the world outside of Silicon Valley and New York. Tel Aviv got demoted this year. But I mean, L LA is on the rise, and there's a lot happening here. The, the consumer success stories that have come out of the city in recent years are pretty noteworthy. I would, I would even venture to say that LA has really become the hub of consumer experiences right now in mobile. What do you think? You're really kissing some ass to start. You really want to get on their good side, I'm don't just saying, you? This is, you know, I don't. Ari's like, you're the most beautiful people I've ever seen. That's what that's that's what it's all about. We'll come yeah. full circle. But let's talk about Glide. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we have an hour. L, you know, I don't spend a lot of time in LA, so I wanna, I wanna connect a little bit. There's there's so much happening in the world right now, which is crazy, crazy. Science fiction is becoming reality. Self-driving cars, virtual reality is about to hit big. We have computers on our wrists. The smart home. Now you just talk to your computer that you buy from Amazon for 180 bucks. It's crazy. It's crazy what's happening. And so we've been thinking a lot about how this wild world that we've been dreaming about for most of the last century is going to impact how we communicate with one another. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with a product called Snapchat. Snapchat took the face and put that back into casual communication. We've been texting for so many years now, which is this behavior which started really on the desktop with 10 fingers on a keyboard. And then it moved to the handset that sits in our pocket with two fingers on a keyboard. But it's a little bit ironic because you've got this supercomputer in your pocket connected to this lightning fast data network with an HD camera. And we're communicating with other people with our thumbs. It's so backwards when you take a step back and think about it. And so I was personally pained by this on behalf of humanity and set out to create a more human and natural way to communicate casually throughout the day. And video is unparalleled as a means of digital communication. It's the closest thing we have to actually being there in person. Live video. The problem is, and this is something that I personally experienced when I moved to Israel in 2008, it's a video call is impractical almost all the time. When I video call you and you're not expecting it, not only am I demanding that you stop everything you're doing and you tune in and you, and you watch me, I'm also demanding that you open up your world and put yourself on live video right now. Plus, this angle is really bad. Right? This is a really bad angle, I, I've noticed. It's my least favorite angle to look at myself. I, I think you look pretty good from this angle. Thank you. And so I experienced all of the shortcomings of video calling when I was living 10,000 miles away from my close friends and family. And at the same time, I experienced the convenience of text messaging, asynchronous communication. But the two had never actually merged, right? Video messaging wasn't a thing because it was super slow and you couldn't actually have a conversation. And so what we realized was that 
Video messaging had never taken off because of technical limitations. If you knew you had to wait 10 minutes from the moment you sent a text message until the first possible time you could receive a response, how much would you be texting? That's what video messaging has been and continues to be, with one exception. And that's Glide. Glide is the world's first and only messaging application which leverages streaming video technology, that technology that you're familiar with from video calling applications like Skype and FaceTime. We re-engineered that technology and enabled sub-second latency, 60 milliseconds from the moment you tap record to the moment whoever you're sending that message to can watch that video. And what that does is it turns video messaging for the first time into a real-time communications platform, like WhatsApp is today. I send you a text. You see I'm typing. You get the text immediately. You send one back. You can have a real-time chat. So let's get, let's get a quick snapshot of the business just for everybody. Um, so a couple quick questions. What year did you start? We founded the company in May of 2012. OK, so pretty recently. We launched the product a year later. All right, so you got the product in market in May of 2013. Yeah. All right. And for those of you, I mean, I would definitely encourage you, grab your mobile device. Won't be rude. Download Glide. Play around with it while we're here. So just, and just to bring this down to earth, here's how it works. Right? I have two phones here. I tap, I tap record here, and it's playing here. It's kind of like magic. Did you see how fast that was? I tap record here. Hey, hey, hey. So no other company in the world does that. So we initialize a consumable, high quality video stream and order a magnitude faster than any other. How many, how many downloads have there been of Glide since you guys launched? Over 20 million. That's quite impressive. Um, how much money have you guys raised? About 30 million. And how big is your team? 65, cool. mostly engineers. So I think one of the things that I'd love for us to dive into for a little bit, and then we're going to kind of go backwards after that and talk about your background, is those numbers by anybody's account would be all of our dreams of what we'd like to be able to do, right? Everybody hopes to be able to do what you and your team have done, which is within two years have a consumer application that tens of millions of people are using. Um, so let's talk about that, and we'll get a little bit into the tech and how you developed it. But when you first launched it, um, did it start to take off right away, or what was that first couple months like, and what did you do to get the word out there about Glide? So the first thing we did is we built an application that was in a private beta. So we, we built it first on iOS. This is a little tip. Does anybody work for Apple in the room? Raise your hand if you work for Apple. OK, so Apple has this thing called an enterprise license. And it allows you to create an application internally. It's not as relevant today as it was then, because you can use test flight. Jason knows all about that. But we wanted to, we wanted to get it out there and get people using the product before we actually released it publicly on the App Store. So th there's this thing called an enterprise license. You pay 300 bucks a year. And then you can create applications that you release internally. And so we did that first. You know, we had contractors, folks like yourselves, that you know, signed an agreement. And, and you're not an engineer, right? You're on the business side. So I, I actually am an engineer, but I have not been hands-on in the code on Glide. I'm, a, I'm like, I have a hard engineering background, mechanical, energy, environmental, and chemical engineering, which I got away from, because those projects take way too long and cost way too much to actually get off the ground. So go software. And then from there, we refined the product. And a few. Did that refining take place in that year between what you said, right? So May of, 2000, May of 2012 to May of 2013, is that when the six, product iteration was six happening? Six months. Heads down, just building. Yeah. About six months in a private beta. And then we decided we were going to press go. 
what was the biggest thing you learned in private beta? So this is, this is really valuable, right? We all put, uh, have a vision for what our first product is, and it almost never works the way that we hope it does. So once you got it out after the first six months, what, did, what were the most important things you learned in the, over the course of the next six months before you took it live to the public? Yeah, so there was a fundamental aspect of the product that we realized we got wrong and then we fixed before we launched. What was that aspect? So basically, there's a, one of the things that's so unique about Glide is that you can capture a message, which is up to five minutes long, and you can capture as many of those as you want. So you, I have like tens of thousands of videos that I've sent or received from close friends and family on my phone, but they're not actually on my phone. They're stored in the cloud. So all those videos, although I have access to them, they don't take up any space on my phone. So the fact that there's archiving built in, and yes, you can delete a message, and you can actually, this is very cool, you can unsend a video after you send it, because it's stored in the cloud. It's useful. So. You're speaking from personal experience, I assume. I mean, it's useful. It's yeah. useful to be able to, you know, to hit delete. So that archived log of, of the videos that you've sent and received was separate from the real-time ping pong, walkie talkie like video experience. And then we realized that that was, that was confusing. A lot of users, because they weren't expecting this whole walkie talkie real time experience, yeah. kind of got stuck in the, in the history. Mm -hmm. And so we had them separate. It was like a drawer that you pulled up. So then we fused that together before we launched the product. That's cool. And so that was one of your biggest learnings? Yeah, definitely. And then the other thing that we realized is that the video length is a little bit too short. So we made it a little bit longer when we launched the product. That's great. So you get it out there in May of 2013. What did the first couple months look like? Was it just wildfire, or was it a slow burn, and then, and then something started to hit to get user adoption? So we, we were very fortunate in that Apple noticed us out of the gate. So we, we debuted the product before we launched it at Macworld. It was back in February of 2013. And then you know, I guess there were some folks from Apple walking around. So three months later, we launched the product. I flew into, I remember this, I flew into New York, I had a meeting with an investor, and I was on my way to the airport, and I just checked the App Store, and I saw we were on the front of the App Store is the number one new and noteworthy app across the world. Wow. So that was at launch. So that was... And did you do anything to grease the wheel? I mean, other than presenting at Macworld, did you try to reach out to people at Apple, or did they just kind so, of... So, yeah, it was like a friend of a friend that worked in retail, but I, I don't know how much bearing that had. But I think the fact that we decided to go you iOS the, first. You mean at one of the Apple stores? What? When you say retail. Like on the corporate side. OK, got it. Yeah. And you uh, like just walked up to a Mac genius, and you're like, hey, <laughs> I got this app. Can you help me feature it? The guy's like, no problem. <laughs> I'm right on that, Ari. Wouldn't it be awesome if it was that easy? I think like could, secret two about <laughs> Apple that you don't know about. Walk up to any Mac. So I, you know, I'd like to think that they, they took note that we built something that was truly unique. You know? So that helped a lot. So you know, all of a sudden, you know, front page of the App Store, you got a week of pretty serious featuring, and another week of also some pretty good featuring. Like They move you into the specific category afterwards. And so that got us users. You know, we, had, we, we, had, we picked up you know, an, an Apple feature like that can get you anywhere between 20 and maybe close to 100,000 users in a week. So that's pretty meaningful. So then right after that, we went to, uh, we applied for uh, the battlefield at TechCrunch Disrupt New York. And they didn't accept us uh, because they like products that are pre-launch. And so we'd already debuted the product. We tried to get in because we hadn't launched Android yet, but that wasn't good enough for them. But we went there knowing that some of the, they have this thing called the startup Alley, I think, right? So there's like 150 startups there. And one of them gets chosen to go into the battlefield. You're just demoing, right? right. You have like conference. a little table in yeah. this massive room. And we went there with the, the whole goal of us being there was to get into the battlefield. And so our community manager, Sarah. You can win like one company out of the 150 if you get enough user votes, right? If you get their tickets or their badges. Right, exactly, on the floor. Yeah. And uh, it's unclear how 
exactly the voting works, but, <laughs> but whatever it was, you know, one of those companies gets to go into the battlefield. Fine. So our community manager came dressed up as a robot. It was like a play, because we have this thing when you join the app, it's called Sarah Glidebot, and you send her messages, and then she kind of simulates the experience. And so she walked around as a robot. I've had so many guys I show it to be like, who's this girl that's just messaging me? <laughs> like she messages everybody. <laughs> You're not special. <laughs> True. But she's very pretty. I mean, and she's a real person. Yeah, and three-day rule: a great person to get set up. Is she, is she married? <laughs> she is single. There you go. All right. And in Jerusalem. <laughs> so that got a lot of attention. We demoed the app. We showcased what we were building on Android. Long story short, we won. We got into the battlefield. We got to the semis. We got to the finals. So we we're audience choice. So we we're a finalist. And then with that. You know, that gave us some more, I think Megan Quinn from Kleiner Perkins coined the term gliding on stage, you know, at TechCrunch. So we got a lot of visibility from there. And had you, had you raised any money up to that point? Yeah, a little bit. We raised um, just shy of two million at cool. that point. So, so let's go back and then we're going to start with your story and, and get back to this point that we're at in Glide and then talk about the things you've learned since then. Um, where, did, where did you grow up? I grew up in and around Philadelphia. For those of you who are familiar, I, I was actually born in Wilmington, Delaware. And did you have You'll Probably the... get your credit card bills from there, right? Are you from Wilmington? That's crazy. Did you, um, did you always dress like you were going to Temple? No. Um, <laughs> did, you, did you always have the entrepreneurial bug? The Temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago. That's what, we just commemorated that. Yeah, that's nice. Did, did, did you have the entrepreneurial bug as a kid? Yes. When, uh, I think for my 10th birthday, my parents bought me uh, a book called How to Be CEO. I, you know, I watched up, I grew up watching my father fly around the world uh, on business. He was a marketing director of a publicly traded company. So, and, uh, and I also grew up with a, with a, with a, a distrust of corporate America and big corporations. So my, uh, I watched my father invest 30 years into one company and then, you know, then go through restructuring and it's like, so that had a pretty big impact on me. But where'd you end up going to college? I went to Wash U in St. Louis with this guy up here. <laughs> okay. And so you started, you were studying engineering there. So engineering. Okay. You finished college, out of college, what do you start doing? So. So w my senior year they had these pitch competitions. They were starting this whole entrepreneurial initiative. So I just started pitching, and so I... Uh, You're a young guy. How old are you? Yeah, 20, 21. No, no, how old are you now? Uh, 31. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was, I had, actually I had this crazy idea to start a, um, I still think it's a good idea. I'd be very happy if someone in this room runs with this. I had this idea to start a melon juice company. <laughs> there's no, there's no melon, like melon is really good and refreshing. There's honeydew and there's cantaloupe, <laughs> there's watermelon. Right? But no one's... Honeydew is the worst fruit ever. You always got a fruit bowl. You get like two blueberries, a strawberry, and then like eight honeydew. Raise your hand if you enjoy honeydew. No. Come, look at this. Jay. Honeydew. All right. Come so, on. So I had this idea to start this melon juice company. I wanted to call... And I bought the domain. I think this is... I still think it's a great name. Mmm, melon. <laughs> With three M's. How do you know how many M's there are? How three, many M's you have to type in? Three M's, two M, You know, I think we bought a couple of domains. And so I was. You should have just gone with melons. I was. I, I like. I won one of these little competitions with this melon juice concept, and I was so. I was serious about this. Did you ever make the melon juice? Yeah, we. Yeah, we were. Because we, then we had to figure out how to like make. You know, industrial. Did anybody drink the honeydew melon. juice? Yes. I, we had three flavors. One was honeydew kiwi. It's. I'll make you some juice sometime. All right. So you got the melon company. And then no, so I didn't get the melon company, and instead my advisor had this nanotech startup that, <laughs> that had this incredible way of producing nanomaterials. And he ran out of money, and he never was able to prove the, the value of this technology, and literally just shut down the reactor. And then, whatever, as I was finishing up, he gave me a chance to, to try to figure out how to make this thing work. And to make a long story short, it went really well. We got the company acquired by the world's largest materials manufacturer within a year. So that kind of got me hooked. I saw from there what a few people 
with limited resources can do if they're thinking smart and working hard and working together. You know, one plus one equals three. And so after the so you're pretty young. You have an opportunity to go through an acquisition. What happens then? Yeah. So. Uh, so, I, so I deferred graduate school for a year. I had this opportunity to go back uh, to grad school and, and all expenses paid and, and um, same advisor. And so I went back to grad school and then he basically gave me a startup within the university. And uh, it was basically a cleaner way of burning coal. I studied combustion. And that went well. And to make a, a long story short, in a little over a year, I, I finished my master's. And, and this research that I did in graduate school was leveraged to create this big international research consortium. They raised a bunch of money from industry. And then I considered joining that. But instead, I, as I was finishing my thesis, I started a company to help drive growth for startups and incubate my own ideas. So when you say drive growth for startups, would you, just, would you do the marketing for them? So I, I, at that time, fresh at engineering school, I was actually brought on board as like a, as a tech guy to like figure out, you know, microelectromechanical systems and mm -hmm. you know material properties and stuff like that. I, it's been a long time, but that's what I was doing then. I was designing 3D models and that kind of thing. I kind of miss that stuff, but. And so then, uh, how many years more was it until you got Glide going? Right, so that was back in 2008, and then I basically dropped everything and moved to Israel, and started a few things there, and then started working on what became Glide at the end of 2011. That's cool. And, and did you have you have co-founders, right? Right. How many co-founders are there? Two. There's two others, so it's three of us. So talk about. Um, and so initially, you raised two million dollars, right? Was that, is that, or how much did you raise? Well, so the, the way, uh, so initially, the backstory, we, we, did a, we did a convertible note, 150K. Shortly thereafter, we, did a, we raised half a million bucks, and then we raised another one and a quarter. Cool. In, in what period of time? Um, all of that was in about nine months. Great. So just show of hands, how many folks here either in the last couple months or currently um, are fundraising or have fundraised. All right, so you got at least a dozen folks here. Um, I think one of the things that's really exceptional about your story is you, know, um, you don't, often when you hear of companies getting to your stage, right, in the $30 million, you forget that it started off with 150,000 raise. Totally. And a half million raise and a million dollar raise. So talk about those early raises what was the pitch and what was the process like to get that capital? And for folks that are maybe trying to raise their first million dollars, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, so it's the typical story. You know, I'd never raised money before. And I don't know why, but I just, I just knew I could do it. I, just, I, I had this feeling that, you know, just keep pushing. And it's, it's demoralizing, you know, and it's tiring. But when you close your first round, it's, it's an incredible feeling, and it gets easier. Assuming you make progress and you're smart about who you take money from, they should be p the type of people that you would want to go and get a drink with, people that you would want to hang out with, and people that you are very confident you can trust. Were, were they personal connections? Or were they folks that you were getting introduced to? It was, a, it was a combination of both. But yeah, I mean, the first money in the company was pretty much friends and family. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, I consciously didn't take any money from anyone in my family. Um, <laughs> I, I would recommend keeping those two things separate. Thankfully, my father is like very conservative when it comes to that kind of stuff. But we took uh, a small check from one of my co founders' fathers, it worked out fine. And, uh, you know, I had some, some friends from school that had a little bit of money to invest. And it worked out well. I'll, I'll, let me share one more thing. Um, my office mate in Palo Alto, I moved from Jerusalem to Palo Alto a little bit less than a year ago. Uh, Jim Scheinman, he was, uh, he was like the first COO of Tango. He's built a few unicorns and he's an early stage consumer investor. His, his, the, the name of the VC is Maven Ventures. If you're building a consumer app, I would recommend them. He talks about uh, three 
ingredients in a founding team, and it's most easy if th those are embodied in three different people. There's the hustler, there's the designer, and there's the hacker. And so he just gave a talk in our office in Jerusalem, and he talked about this, and I realized that we perfectly fit that mold. And so you, you kind of need those Which three elements. I, I, I guess I'm the hustler in the, yeah. And so, you know, one of my, I have two co-founders, Jay and Usher. So Jay is a hacker. He looks like a hacker, you know, and he's, he's been a tinkerer his whole life. Usher is an artist. He doesn't actually paint with a paintbrush, but he's a designer, and he built 40 plus mobile products before Glide. And so Jay and I tried to get the ball rolling for many months, but we never really, we never really got over, overcame the activation energy and you know, had a spark. It was, but as soon as we had Usher around the table having that real product intuition, um, it happened. And shortly thereafter, we, you know, it was within a few months we raised our first money. So I would, you know, I would definitely keep those three elements in mind. You need someone that, you know, would say in Yiddish, in their kishkas, in their innards, <laughs> is, uh, you know, embodies each of those three elements. That's great advice. I love that. Um, so you, you have a pretty technical background. It sounds like the team did. Uh, you know, you, you shared with me the really cool story. Can you talk about how you actually ended up developing the tech for Glide? Because it's a, a lot of the software that we're building, even projects that I'm, you know, tinkering with on the side right now, they're not nearly as complicated as the technology you had to develop. And so how did that all come together? It's a great question. So there, there is a backstory. I won't, I won't bore you. But in short, the three founders of Glide had a very clear product vision. We wanted to make video communications always accessible. We wanted to make video messaging work at the speed of light and actually be easier and more accessible and more convenient than text messaging, which is a pretty high bar for video. Yeah. And we literally searched the world for a company that could enable that vision, and we came up dry. And we found a developer, my, this, the hacker, my co-founder Jay, found a developer on a forum back from 2008 who talked about how he was able to hack an iPhone back in 2008 and send live video. So this was, is before. What was the forum? What was it, was, the it, was, you know, it was, it was some sort of an iPhone or you know, Apple developers forum. Yeah. So back in 2008, iPhones didn't connect to 3G networks, did not have front-facing cameras. FaceTime wasn't a word. HTTP live streaming, which is the underlying video streaming technology that we're all familiar with now, didn't exist. But there was some guy that was streaming live video from an iPhone. And so we hunted him down, found out that he worked for this company that just happened to be in our backyard in Israel. And we found the owners of this company on LinkedIn, pinged them. They got back to us like within minutes. And the next day, I was on a train from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. And it was like love at first sight. The guy picks me up at the train station. He's like cool dude with like long, wavy hair. Takes me up to his office. You know? And to make a long story short, th this was a team that had a vision that was before its time and had an incredible technology, but never really cracked it in the consumer market. And fast forward to today, that team is all part of Glide, and that forms the backbone of our video engineering team. But what we were trying to do was basically impossible, except for this, this tribe of brilliant video engineers that was, just happened to live in Tel Aviv. And so I think the lesson there is, is that you know, if, if you have a, if you have a, I'm trying to translate from Hebrew. We say, uh, raise your hand if you speak Hebrew. Oh, that's enough, okay. So, uh, 
Now raise your hand if you got bar mitzvah presents, but don't speak Hebrew. <laughs> That's more than the first one. No, if, 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 uh, if you have a will, if you, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's in the Talmud. What's the, what's the phrase in Hebrew? It's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a passage in the Talmud on the 10th page on the second folio of the tractate called Maka. It says, Baderech she'adam, this is uh, Aramaic, it's Hebrew. Baderech she'adam rotze leilech ba on, on the path that a person wants to go, on that path he's led. It's a crazy thing. We can get, that's a whole other conversation. But if you have a will and it's real and it's rooted in something that's real, that's, that's you're, you're tapped in, then it, it can happen. It's kind of like, you know, Luke Skywalker using the force. You know, you take a step when there's, no, there's nothing there. there. There's a leap of faith that is intrinsic to being a founder. I, I, had, I uh, moderated an investor panel in Jerusalem, and we're talking about I asked, I asked one of the big seed investors in our ecosystem back in Jerusalem if making an early stage investment decision is, is mostly emotional, because that was my theory. It's really, it's really an emotional decision at the end of the day. And he said, and he's not such a religious guy, he said, no, it's a religious decision, meaning there has to be a leap of faith to actually believe in this thing. Because there's nothing, you know, there's maybe some pattern recognition, but there's no data to really back it up. And so all the more so does that apply to a founder. So, you know, we just set out, we, were, we had a lot of volition that this needed to happen. Technically, this was possible. And even though we couldn't find any company to do it, boom, it just happened out of thin air. So I want, I want to fast, and by the way, that's incredible. Um, I want to fast forward till today um, and talk about the flip side of the coin. And I think you really well connected and empathize with what a lot of us are going through in the early stage. Today, you're um, one of the hottest tech companies, leading one of the hottest tech companies, got a team of 65 people. You've got a brand that you've got to protect. What are, what are the big things that you think about and worry about that keep you up? Um, what are the things that are top of mind for you right now in the stage that you are of a CEO? Great question. At the end of the day, any team, and a company is a team, any team is a group of people working together. And so naturally, we as a company think a lot about human communication. I find that human communication is the most important thing when creating synergy, right? Synergy is one plus one equals three. And so the human element, being sensitive, being thoughtful, being kind, these, these are the foundations of any team. And when you're working in such a high pressure environment. And the nature of any startup is things always cost a lot more than you ever thought they would, and they take a lot longer than you ever thought they would. Like two, three X is par for the course, right? And so, you know, you're always falling up short from your own internal expectations. It's easy to beat yourself up, and then it's easy to lose sight of the other and not be sensitive to your teammates. So I find day in and day out, the most important thing is to be empathetic and to be thoughtful and to be caring and to be authentic, to be human. Where do you fall down as a leader? What are the biggest things you struggle with right now? So I'm living in Palo Alto, California, and my presence in the office is a virtual telepresence robot, which is basically a segue with an iPad strapped to the top. <laughs> so my company has a robot as a CEO on the ground. So that yeah, presents some challenges. you're spending most of the time still in, in Jerusalem and Israel with the team there? So I'm, I'm in Palo Alto. You're in Palo Alto communicating with. But right, but 
Glide HQ and where almost all of our team is, is 10,000 miles away. And so that's a challenge, right? It's 10 time zones apart. Thank God we have Glide, which makes it a lot easier. But you know, it's, it's definitely tough not being there. So I travel a lot. But you know, nothing replaces actually being there in person. Glide is a close second. A video call is a close second. Glide was your first time, though, as CEO, right? Or b besides the company right before it, right? Yeah, Glide is my first time so as CEO. So CEO, the company is growing. What, what are some of the biggest things that you've learned along the way? I mean, you're still pretty young. You're 31 years old. You find yourself running an incredibly successful company. 65 people report to you. I'm sure that number is going to double and triple in short order. We what, are hiring. What, 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 Jo jobs at Glide.me. Um, what are the biggest things that you've learned? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this human element, which is kind of ironic because you know, Glide is really all about putting the human element back in our casual communication throughout the day, you know, and, and taking texting, which is so unidimensional, and making that vivid with tone, right? Texting doesn't have any tone, mm -hmm. and there's no face. Um, so uh, you know, that's definitely one point. What did you learn as a leader? Like, what are the yeah. what are things that you didn't know at 27 or 28 that you now know at 31? You know, self-discipline when you really don't have a boss. I mean, all my employees, in a way, are my boss, and all my investors are my boss. But it's it's a lot different. You know, everyone really trust me and no one's managing my time. So self-discipline is clutch. And you know, it, it's, you know, you know, I'm somewhat creative and I'm somewhat passionate. You know, those things tend to not come together with tremendous innate self-discipline. Or maybe organization or things like yeah. that. Yeah, I'm somewhat organized, but it's, you know, sticking to you know, a rigorous schedule, you know, that's clockwork, you know. And is there anything that you've done or tried that helped you get better at that, or was it just a commitment to the process? Yeah, I, you know, so I think, I think with, you know, with anything, whenever you're trying to grow, it's just all about, you know, taking baby steps, right? So it's taking something on, making a commitment to yourself that's realistic. It's almost super realistic. It almost feels like a, you know, a, 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 like a layup. But then taking that on and then committing and then actually following through. And also tracking your progress is if you if you're not tracking your progress, it's you know it's very, very hard to make incremental incremental improvements. But after you you know take one step and then after, you know, it takes depending on who you ask, it takes between three weeks and forty days to build a habit. Once you've built that habit and then on to the next step. What was funding like from the other perspective, right? So you went through the same experience that a lot of us are going through, how do you get that first couple hundred thousand dollars? When you were taking in $20 million, $25 million, what did you learn in that process? Was there anything that surprised you? Did it feel easy? Did it feel hard? What was it like to raise such a large round? Yeah, so surprisingly, it's, it's really the same thing. The stakes are a little bit higher. The check is a bit bigger. But it's the same process. And again, I find it, it, it comes down to the, the investor's decision at the end of the day is really going to be largely emotional. So you know, when I come into a meeting, I might have a deck, but I rarely start a meeting with a computer on the table plugged into a PowerPoint. The first thing I want to do is connect to the person on the other side of the table as a person. I want to establish chemistry and rapport and mutual trust. By the way, I think that's a great recommendation. I think one of the biggest mistakes I, I see people make in the pitch process is immediately get people focused on a PowerPoint. Or, you know, the best pitch meetings I've ever seen is where PowerPoint never comes out, and it's just a conversation you know, with a group of folks. And at the end of the day, any investor is investing in you as a person. Chances are your whole idea will take a 90 degree turn, and you'll be doing something totally different. And so the investor is entrusting you with whatever that check size is to make something magical happen. 
Um, I want to dive a little bit into the specifics of um, what makes for successful apps, right? So things you learn at Glide, things, I mean, one of the things that, just even in our brief conversations, is I'd say you're one of probably the, the better product people I've ever met, right? And just having brief conversations with you. Um, and then a little bit, we'll open this up to questions. So think of what's on your mind, and we'll have somebody come around with some mics. Um, if you guys could help us out, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, what, what are some of the, you know, obviously, like, there's these big categories where, you know, apps um, have too much friction when people first join. They don't, they're not getting enough engagement. They have a hard problem with retention. What are some common mistakes that you see people make as they put their apps out? And what general advice would you have for folks as they're trying to get adoption of their consumer apps? So, J Jason, you're too kind. Yeah. I don't, and, I, and I wish that was true. We have the no, same, really, even we have these problems today, right? I, know, I, I would love it. By the way, this, and this, is, this actually, I think, answers your question directly, although it might seem indirect. I personally invite each and every one of you to join me as a partner in making Glide the best communication experience the world has ever seen. And so I encourage each and every one of you, you can do it right what's now. Your, what's your offended. Twitter handle? What can they send product just, recommendations? It's just my name, Ari Roisman. R-O-I-S-M-A-N. Yeah, just download the product. Download God, it's free. There's, there's no way that product can charge you money. It's free, it's a free app, 100% free. Download the product right now. Once you join, you go to the Friends tab, and you can add me. My, my Glide ID is my first name, A-R-I. I don't usually give that out on a stage. But I, first time, you know, first time presenting in LA, feel good, feeling good about LA. You guys, you guys usurped Israel as this, is, the, is the biggest ecosystem outside of the Bay Area. I like how you started, by the way. You're like, LA is the best next to Silicon Valley <laughs> and next to New York. <laughs> Well, I'm, I, so, I, I, by the way, that's not my, so the Startup Genome, which is this project, just released, I should have made that clear, they just released their, their report for 2015. So they do this every year. They actually go through and analyze each ecosystem in the world and produce rankings. So last year, that's how the rankings came up, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm referring right, to. So folks are going to send you product recommendations to Glide. What general recommendations do you have for folks? So th that's, that's, that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. So, so my, my Glide idea is Ari. So Glide, glide me. We can, we can just chat, super easy. But use the product and tell me where it's confusing or what you don't like about it. This is how you build a great product. Use every opportunity you have to talk to users and to get honest, candid feedback from users. It's an iterative process. When Kevin Systrom was building Instagram, he basically hung out at, I don't know, was it Beverly Hills High School? One of the high schools around here. He, was the, he had kids you know, over at the office every day, you know, looking at screens, trying to understand user flows, this copy, that copy. Right? I mean, Snapchat caught on at Stanford in a, in a very similar way. He was a student there. By the way, one word of caution. I, I might say be careful of just hanging around high schools. <laughs> And like lurching outside, but the, the general point is, is well is well. Taken. I'm assuming everybody in this room has some social tact, and <laughs> maybe I should. I don't know. I don't know LA all that well. So y you've got to stay connected to your user. You've got to talk to your users all day, every day, and you know there's metrics to track, right? So. You've got to be data driven too. You have to be very smart about understanding what are, what are the most important actions that a, that a user needs to take in their first minute in, in the product experience. Right? So for us, getting a user to send a message on day zero, the first day, that's what it's called, day zero, day one. Counterintuitively, is actually your second day in the app. Day zero is the you know when they first install the application. Getting a user to send a message on day zero is clutch. Getting them to send a message on day one is clutch. Getting them to receive a message, 
making sure they have that real-time ping-pong experience, which we call the glide aha moment, is clutch. You have to understand what are those experiences that a user needs to have immediately, and then design the product flows to, to put them right in that experience. Just to get specific, though, for a second, I mean, one of the things that I think you that the company is great about that I think some people would say is aggressive is, is notifications. I literally just got I have a message on my I have a Apple Watch right now. Morgan Jones has just joined Glide. Say hi. Hey, Morgan Jones. <laughs> right? And um, the company is, is really aggressive about sending. Now, part of it is you have to have notifications for just knowing that you're getting the messages. But I, I think one of the things that folks underestimate is the power, when done correctly, of using notifications to keep ongoing retention and engagement. Definitely. It's, look, and it's, it's a balance, right? And you know, we, we follow what we see as industry standard in our space. You know, having that type of a social hook where when a friend joins, you get a push, it's pretty much industry standard. right? And you know, another thing we added is when you receive a message and you don't watch that message, we'll send you a reminder. Now, you can customize well, You even send something. a notification when somebody is, is in the process of sending the message, and then you send another notification right afterwards that you have a message, right? So you get. No, so you get, you, get, you get a notification when someone starts recording. Yeah. Oh, and then that, that's the only one. That's it. And then if you don't watch that within. Then you get a reminder. And, we, and by the way, we A B test this stuff. So sometimes it's been two minutes, sometimes it's been an hour, right? If you don't watch it within that amount of time, we'll send you a reminder. What did you from the AB? Where did you start, and where did the AB test take you? So did did you start with a shorter period of time, or a longer? And in your tests, what did you learn? So we've tried all. I don't even know exactly where we are right now on the map, but it's it's all data driven, right? And so that's that's another thing is, and it's getting easier. When we started, we basically had to build our own analytics stack from the ground up. You want to be smart about what tools you build in and what events in the app trigger an event that you track. You know, what actions in the app trigger, trigger an event that you track, and then understand how those correlate with retention. And I mean, eventually, to monetize the business, you're going to have to put in ads, right? This is most likely no, not going to be. No, a, no. What's the monetization thought? In your so, so I don't believe ads will be effective in a private communication platform. It's invasive. This is like this is where I, you know, share videos of my kids with my mom. It's like buy bounty hand towels, <laughs> or even 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 a little bit more relevant. You know, I don't know. Download this photo app. I, it just it feels invasive and it feels icky. No. So how how do you think about monetizing the? So business? so one of the things that's so unique about Glide is the fact that when you send a message, it's preserved, if you'd like, on, a, on the cloud. And the it doesn't storage. take up any space. Storage of the so we are, we're intrigued with the Dropbox box model. I and mean, we have billions of messages that our users have sent that we're storing for free. And so you charge for delete. You make more money than that, than the keeping, <laughs> at least to start. The other $1,000 th to delete this message. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. You know, the, the other thing that we're excited about is giving users the opportunity to connect with talented folks in any field. So you know, when you think about how communication will evolve, and I, you know, I, I you know, mentioned some of these trends. What do you mean kind of like fountain, but in live video chat? Like uh, you can talk to an expert on demand? Not exactly. But I, I, think, I think, you know, Giving people, giving content creators or experts, uh, you know, a really easy way to, you know, get their material out there so they can make an impact on the world, and then giving users a way to, you know, quickly access that, I think, can be very powerful. So, last question I've got for now. Tell me about the future. What do you see? What's in two or three years from now, or longer? However, however long you think about it. What does the future of Glide hold? What do you want to turn this company into? And what are, you, what are you most passionate about to take it from where it's at today to the vision of what you see? So our mission 
is to transcend the boundaries of human communication. And what are those boundaries? It's really space and time. And language, that's very good. And, and we've thought a lot about that. If you think about, you know, Skype has shown some demos of how they can translate in real time. You know, we've, we're paying attention to that. Language is definitely a barrier. Independent of language, you know, I think space and time, right? So if we're not in the same room, we're not, we don't have close physical proximity, we can't really talk. If you're busy when I'm free, we can't talk. Glide transcends those boundaries, right? Doesn't matter where you are in the world, I tap a button, Within a second, you get a notification. You can watch that. I feel like you're going to say you're going to build like later. a warp speed generator. It's like very so you know like Bradbury Star Trekish. I like it. My background is you know in energy and combustion, right? Yeah. Maybe we'll get there one day. The the vision here is to become the world's largest and most active video communications network by 2020. And so let me frame that a little bit. Let's think about 2020 for a second. Months ago. A little over three months ago, Apple debuted this product. It's gotten beaten up in the press, which I find ironic, and I'm actually really enjoying the fact that it's gotten beaten up in the press. This is already Apple's most successful product. There were 5.4 million iPhones sold in year one sales. There were less than 20 million iPads, which was really just a big iPhone, sold in, first, in year one sales. They haven't released numbers. But if you back into the numbers, it's looking like they probably sold about 5 million Apple Watches in the first quarter. This is a first generation product that is unlike anything the world has ever seen before. When the iPhone came out, we had Trios, we had Blackberries, we had Palm Pilots. Apple just did it better. This is something totally new. There's no keyboard on this device. The whole paradigm of human computing interaction is in a fundamental shift. We started with punch cards. Then we moved to keyboards on our desks. And then we moved to keyboards in our pockets. We've had a glimpse of the future through Apple's Siri, through Google Now, through Windows Cortana. Now, Amazon has a product called the Echo. In 2020, it will be normal. I might even go as far as to say more common to communicate with computers in the same way we communicate with other people, through natural language. And you think about having a computer that costs a couple hundred bucks in your kitchen or wherever in your house, or a computer on your wrist where there is no keyboard. What's communication going to look like when you get all your notifications on your wrist or on a fashionable piece of eyewear and there's no keyboard? How are you going to, how are you going to talk back? You're going to talk. You're going to tap and talk. You're not going to pull out a keyboard. Virtual reality. Facebook, as far as I understand, intends to sell millions Oculus, millions of Oculus headsets at launch. For those of you that raise your hand if you've experienced what the Oculus is. It's crazy. And it only costs 200 bucks. I, I'm sad to say, but I think it's inevitable. People are going to die inside of an Oculus. It's, it's, such, it's such a compelling experience. Again, when you're spending, Facebook, the world's largest social network, bought Oculus. You think they're not thinking about the communications layer and the social networking layer? What is communication going to look like when you're inside a virtual headset? Right? And you've got joysticks. Again, the power of natural language. So you guys can be at the forefront of that. So I foresee a world as, as high-speed data networks become ubiquitous across the globe, and as 
You know, we started with text messaging. Look at Snapchat. Snapchat put the face back in messaging. Messaging is more human all of a sudden. I believe video is next. And the fact that video communications hasn't really taken off is due to the form factor, due to the fact that it's been confined to a call where we both have to be available and have simultaneous desire to exchange. As soon as video messaging becomes just as reliable as a text message, as sending a text, and the communication paradigm is just as seamless, and we've got supercomputers on our wrists with front-facing cameras, and you, my best friend, know that when I sent you that message, I act, it, was actually, it actually took me a longer time to dictate the message. This is, a, this is a little bit of a finer point, but bear with me for 30 seconds. It takes longer to dictate a message, plus there's all sorts of errors, than it does to just tap and talk and to send you my voice and my face. And when me, when, when, when I'm the recipient and I know that you consciously chose to only send me a dictated version of whatever you were saying, and as opposed to doing that which was easier, it will be considered evasive and somewhat offensive. So social conventions will change as computing evolves and as natural language computing becomes ubiquitous. And so I foresee a world where the communications layer that connects all of these devices that we're interacting with all day, every day, is being more natural and being more human. For the same reason that we pay thousands of dollars to buy a plane ticket and fly to the other side of the world to see someone in person and to look them in the eyes and experience life with them, people will choose to tap and talk as opposed to this. Well, you are certainly a great communicator, and I'm sure uh, you're going to get a lot of messages on Glide from the folks here. I'm just incredibly thankful for your time, your inspiration. You're obviously unbelievably passionate and articulate about the difference you want to make in the world, and you made a big difference to all of us. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.